two, I want two things asked to happen. One, open your Bibles tonight to the book of Numbers. And uh, if we could get the handouts passed out, we got a couple of young men that are going to bring you a piece of paper. Don't try to figure it out. You'll get lost. Uh, but it, we'll get home before the night's over. So if you turn to the book of Numbers and chapter number 21 tonight. So we're going to do uh, some uh, things over the next few weeks that aren't necessarily tied together, but it's the same intention, and that's to prepare us for a series uh, uh, about or concerning becoming apologists. Who knows what a uh, um, you know what it means to be an apologist or ap what that means? Yes. It does mean defending your faith, though that has a lot of connotations. Like this is not a military. We're not standing at the door with spiritual shotguns or anything like that. And really what it is, is a, that, that apologetics, right, defending the faith, is really about persuading men of truth. So when we sit down with folks who either don't believe anything or believe something completely different than us, apologetics or understanding some things about that is how we persuade them of truth, Okay. So it might be true to some degree that there was a point in our country where you could tell people very little and have them make big decisions spiritually. And that's because we had some things uh, about truth and about uh, God more, I would say, entwined into our culture in greater depth. We don't have that today. Uh, we have all kinds of uh, things going on spiritually and I'll say theologically that make it hard for people uh, to get through all of that and come to Christ. We are here in great part to win people to Christ for the glory of God. It is the mission and commission of our church. Now that's not the only part of the commission, but certainly it's the starting ground of it. And the more we prepare ourselves to be ready to give an answer, I would call apologetics that, though Lori's not wrong, but I don't ever want us to think of it being this kind of a thing. Okay, we do not win people by the wrath of man. It never works the righteousness of God. We do not win people by winning over them. We win them by so exalting truth in Christ that, that he becomes irresistible. He said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. Amen? And so we're going to be headed into that. I just want to spend some time in some truth uh, as we go there, which is what we always do. Numbers chapter 21. So if you'd stand with me uh, this evening uh, in honor of the Word of God, we'll begin to read in verse 10. We have a lot of ground to cover. I hope we can cover it very quickly. I suppose that depends on me, not you. Uh, but uh, verse uh, number 10 of uh, Numbers chapter uh, 21. <clears throat> the Bible says this. And the children of Israel set forward and pitched in Oboth. And they journeyed from Oboth and pitched at Ej Avarim in the wilderness, which is before Moab, toward the sun rising. From thence they removed and pitched in the valley of Zared. From thence they removed and pitched on the other side of Arnon, which is in the wilderness that cometh out of the coasts of the Amorites. For Arnon is the border between Moab of Moab, between Moab and the Amorites. Wherefore it is said in the book of the wars of the Lord, what he did in the Red Sea and in the brooks of Arnon and at the stream of the brooks that groweth, goeth down to the dwelling of Ar and lieth upon the border of Moab and from thence they went to Beer, that is the well whereof the Lord spake unto Moses, gather the people together and I will give them water. Then Israel sang this song, Spring up, O well, sing ye unto it. The princes digged the well. Uh, the nobles of the people digged it by the direction of the lawgiver with their staves. And from the wilderness they went to uh, Matanah. And from Matanah to Nahal El. And from Nahal El to Bamoth. And from Bamoth in the valley that is in the country of Moab to the top of Pishka, which looketh toward Yeshimon. 
I'm going to stop reading there. We'll look at some more around this tonight. But uh, um, let's, uh, let's pray and get right in. Heavenly Father, I pray, God, that you'd help us tonight as we look into your word. I pray, Lord, you'd help me. I, I need help above all tonight. I don't take lightly the burden and the weight uh, to teach and preach your word. And I realize, God, that we're not just simply here to... Uh, to to entertain we're not just here to inform but lord we're here to persuade as well to exalt you and to present the truth in such a way dear father that uh, that people would make decisions concerning their life and their relationship with you and so i pray you'd help us uh, in the time that we have and that you'd be honored in both by what we do in it and what we do because of it and i pray these things in jesus name amen thank you for standing and please be seated Want to before we get too much into it? I want to establish a few things. I want you to go to verse number fourteen. I don't know if you caught it when we read by it. It says in verse fourteen, "Wherefore it is said in the book of the wars of the Lord, what He did in the Red Sea and in the brooks of Arnon and at the stream of the brooks that goeth down to the dwelling of Ar." And I do want to draw your attention there to make a point to you and try to keep us on track. It says there that there's a book that exists or that did exist, called the Book of the Wars of the Lord. Now, let me tell you what often happens when people hear this, like uh, the book of uh, Joshua. There are different writings. In fact, there are several different writings that are not canonical, or they're not in the Bible, and they're not by any indication inspired, but they are referenced in the Bible. Okay, so does that throw off, you know, our belief in uh, biblical uh, preservation and inspiration? Are, are we missing something in the Bible? And so every once in a while they need to go out and give us something from a sage of another flavor or something like that. A lot of people get uh, wrapped around this and they begin to question the Bible because it references these things. So let me help you out with this. Quoting an extra biblical sources as themselves does not damage scripture, all right? Now, it would if we use them to perhaps try to correct scripture, but that's not what happened. There was a book. It doesn't exist today by any endeavor, but there obviously was a book. It's mentioned in another place called The Book of the Wars of the Lord. And while no one has a copy of it, how many of you think you can figure out what was in it? The Wars of the Lord. And no doubt it was a recording or a history uh, for the people. And God chooses, as he inspires the word through Moses, to make a reference to it. Not a reference to it as another piece of scripture, simply a reference to what was said in there. And that makes the phrase inspired. Do you get that? That Not that book is inspired, and not that that phrase is, but the use of it here was by God. It was breathed out by God. But let's not read about these things because there are several and then sort of get off track and begin to, uh, to uh, you know, question Scripture or get down the road. There's another one just comes to mind in the book of Joshua, chapter 10, verse 13. It references the book of Jasher, okay? Again, uh, referencing a non-canonical source doesn't do damage to the, to, the, uh, to the inspiration and preservation of Scripture. It's simply part of it was. How many of you know this? That Solomon didn't write every proverb. Okay? It is the Proverbs of Solomon. Solomon certainly assembled that book, but Solomon even gives credit to some other people in there. And part of the book of Proverbs are things that God, let's say, directed and thereby inspired Solomon uh, to uh, gather together into this writing of these Proverbs. Does that make those Proverbs less inspired because of uh, what God might have used as a source of them? In fact, if you'll read the Bible honestly, you'll find out that there are several different people quoted that you've never heard of. And so uh, let's, let's be careful. We believe in the plenary verbal inspiration of the word of God, amen? Everybody knows what that means? Plenary means all, every word. We believe that every word was God breathed. Why do we believe that? Well, we believe that because that's what the Bible itself declares about itself, that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And, and here's how important it is that, uh, that we're told in it that, that the smallest parts of scripture once breathed, that they endure from generation to generation to a thousand generations and that, and that uh, they'll never go away. 
God says that the, the, the yod, right? Uh, it's written jot in English, but it's yod, right? The yod or the tittle, the two smallest little parts of a, of a language that we wouldn't understand its core if we didn't study it because the writing is so different from the way ours is. But they're just the smallest parts and sounds, and yet they affect the meaning of a word of, and therefore of a, of a truth in Scripture. And God says this, every word does matter, Every word is inspired. I caused, breathed what needed to be in there. But that doesn't pre prevent God from saying, what I'm going to put there is this so that we have clear understanding of what I'm teaching. Somebody got this tonight? So quoting an extra biblical source doesn't even give it authority beyond that quote. Okay? It doesn't say you should go find the book of the wars of the Lord. Good way by the, good luck by the way. But because now you'll have the rest of the story. No, this is not a Paul Harvey statement. This is simply that God said, I want you to know this too as a part of the inspired and preserved text of God. Amen? So let's not get hung up on that. This uh, passage of Scripture as we undertake it is a part of the, the journey from Kadesh Barnea uh, to the Promised Land, ultimately from Egypt to the Promised Land, but it really takes off or this part of it after the events at Kadesh Barnea. And I do want to uh, uh, make, uh, I gave you a map of that because I just kind of want you to see the journey and some things. Because I do believe that the statement made, though it is a quote from, a t uh, from uh, the book of the wars of the Lord, according to what God says, I do believe that the statement that accompanies it is the key truth that you and I need to learn from this passage. So let's kind of go through the, journey in fact in numbers chapter 21 where you're at uh, we find in the beginning of it says and when king verse 1 and king arid the canaanite which dwelt in the south heard tell that israel came by way of the spies then he fought against israel and took some of them prisoners and israel vowed a vow unto the lord and said if thou wilt indeed deliver this people into my hand then i will utterly destroy their cities and the lord hearkened unto the voice of israel and delivered up the canaanites and they utterly destroyed them in the and their cities, and he called the name of the place Hormah. And they journeyed uh, from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to encompass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. There are places in Scripture where we might have more detail on different events during the journey, but this passage of Scripture takes us on that journey. And so they went from Kadesh Barnea. We all know that. I, I really would tell you that this journey, of course, began in Egypt. If you look down on the bottom of your handout, there's a part that's not on the map that I drew in. And I'm a very good artist, and you can tell that right now from looking at that. <clears throat> But what you see is a line that goes across uh, the lines I extended out from the, uh, from the Red Sea. The bottom of this, uh, the end of Edom, is the Red Sea. And <clears throat> really not that far south of that uh, point uh, is where uh, I believe clearly the, the crossing of the Red Sea took place. A lot of the journeys that you'll watch, and I don't, I don't want to get on rabbit trails tonight, so, so please stay with me. And, and if I, you think I am, go like this. Huh? Okay. And then I'll get back off it and you'll be fine. But uh, a lot of the uh, maps that you'll see that track the journey of Israel don't take Israel coming out of Egypt across the Red Sea. They take Israel across something that's at least called today the Reed Sea. And it's no real big thing at all. In fact, it was a, a shallow sea and not a, not a significant body of water. I'm pretty sure that the way God constantly brings them back to it, that what happened at the Red Sea is something that only God could do, and he did it for very specific purposes, okay? More than just delivering them. But uh, they, uh, they began in Egypt. They went to Mount Sinai. You know that they stopped at Mount Sinai for a period of time. And they were there, and we talked about it the other day, so I won't spend any time on it, but they got the Ten Commandments and the Covenant and all of those things, built the tabernacle, all of those things that we read about, and they left from there, and they went to a place called Kadesh Barnea. Kadesh Barnea is represented on your map. You can't really see the writing. It's highlighted there, and there's a circle. And so they went. You can follow the black line that goes up to the left from Mount Sinai up to Kadesh Barnea. I drew a circle there, meaning that they stopped there. Not every stop is marked, but several of them are. 
And they were at Kadesh Barnea, and you all know the events of that. That's where they said to God, God, you can't take us in. Our children will die, and, and uh, you're just not big enough for this. And God said, fine, all of you that uh, are above 20, 20 and above, are going to wander in the wilderness. Your children that you say I can't take care of will actually inherit the land, and, and uh, all of that took place. Of course, you also know that after God said that, that they said, no, 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 we'll go up. And they went up, and they started to go into the land, and they were defeated mightily by the Canaanites that were in the land. So after that event, they moved further up. You can see in big letters Beersheba, and that's possibly the site, but somewhere around there of this Horma that's mentioned there, and, and Mount Hor. And they go up to that area, and uh, they, some things happen. Aaron ultimately dies up there, and, and uh, they uh, deal with all of that. And, and then they have a battle with the Canaanites. And they can't go into this land. God won't let them go in and take this land. They have a battle with the Canaanites. And, and the truth is, is it's a moment, please get this, when they get some things right with God. So let's understand this, that, uh, that they, they came out of Egypt following God, and God was still present. He led them all of that time by a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire. We all know that. But just because God is present doesn't always mean that you're with God. In fact, let me give you this truth because this is getting, we'll soon get into the heart of this, but the question in your life is not, is God with me? The question in your life is, am I with God? And the thing you have to strive to do is be with God, walk with God. We'll talk about that in a minute. And so they went up at Kadesh Barnea without God. In fact, Moses writes of it in Numbers 14 and says, look, you can go up, but God's not with you. Let me tell you why he's not with you, because you left him. He says exactly those words. You left God. God said, go this way. You said, no, we'll go this way. And you would understand tonight, church, wouldn't you, that whenever God is clear about direction in our life, and that's what the word of God is, and we decide, no, we're not gonna do that, we're gonna go this way, that when we leave that, we're not simply having a choice, but we're walking away from God being able to work in our life. And until we get back to that place with God, where he's now the master and we're the servant, he leads and we follow and we surrender our lives to him, there's really not much that God is doing in our life. We give God a lot of credit for things that we do. He's just not really there to work. Because not, God's not there to support you and I in our rebellion. Someone figure that's not too hard to figure out. And so... Israel went up and they weren't there and they got defeated. And the reason they got defeated is they weren't with God. I mean, they got out of Egypt going with God. They defeated the armies of the Pharaoh at the Red Sea going with God. God did all of that. But now they go up and they get, uh, they get into a lot of trouble because they weren't with God. And so they finally go up when they get to, uh, to uh, up near Beersheba or Hormah was what it ended up being called. They say this, look, God, we're being attacked. And, and you know what? We're out of place. We belong with you. We read it. And so listen, we're going to, God, if you'll give us this victory, we'll fight it with all of our might because we want to be with you. And what this really was is an aligning of themselves, at least for a moment, back into submission or obedience to God. Does everybody understand that? And they won that battle, but they couldn't go any further. And they turned around, and what they really wanted to do, if you see the arrow where we make a U-turn, and you look across from there, of course, you have the Dead Sea in between, but if you look across, there's a river Zared, and, uh, and what they really wanted to do is they wanted to cut across the very top of Edom there and uh, take a shortcut, and Edom refused them. So now it says in your Bible that, that they ended up journeying, in fact, in verse 4 of chapter 21, it says, and they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to encompass the land of Edom, and the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. And the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there's no bread, neither is there any water here. And so they begin on this long journey that takes them 40 years. And they, they, instead of going the direct route, they end up going down all the way back down to the Red Sea, down near, really, in the area of Mount Sinai, and they have to then go all the way around it. So if you look, the line is blue. I don't know if you can tell. From up by, uh, by Mount Hor uh, and that area where they do the U-turn, that line is blue, and they end up camping, as we read here, for some period of time at a place called Oboth. And then they left Oboth and they went to a place called Ijah Barim, Ijah Avarim. And that is uh, there by the river Zared. 
And it's described this way, in fact, uh, in the, uh, verse 12, they pitch in the valley of Zared. Uh, verse 11, they go to Ejah of Arim. In, in verse 12, they, they, or 11, they camp there by the river Zared. And this is what it says of, in verse 11, in the wilderness, which is before Moab, toward the rising of the sun. So you see the nation of Edom, you see the nation of Moab, you see the, the, uh, the river Zared or the Zared rivers, sort of the southern border of Moab between Moab and Edom there. And you see a question mark behind Ejah of Arim. And I'm telling you that it's a question mark because the Bible says that that place is between the border of Moab and the going down of the sun. Okay? That means that that town really is a little bit east, doesn't it? This map, like any map, is north, south, east, and west, and, and uh, uh, they're coming up now from south to north, and they, they end up camping out here on the east of Moab. And of course, they, uh, they, they would have liked to have gone through all of that country on their own way, but God had a different way. And as they're walking on the journey, it says that they're getting very discouraged, and they're getting very tired, and they're beginning to murmur against God. And as they murmur against God, you need to know this, the pillar of fire did not go out and the pillar of cloud did not stop showing up, but the people were not with God. Do you understand that? They weren't walking with God. They weren't really following God. They were going through some motions of some sort, but they weren't with God. And they would say things, and you might, well, but look, God's right here, so we're golden. Except just because God is with you does not mean that you are with God. Because being with God is an issue of being surrendered and submitted and giving your life to following him, not having him do the work for you. And so they get there and they're, uh, they're nearing now. They've been in the wilderness for a long time. And they get there and they really begin to murmur. We read that and grumble against the Lord and against Moses. And so in verse 8 of chapter 21, God sent fiery serpents. And they were pretty wicked little serpents. If they stung you, uh, you would die. And if, uh, you know, they were probably all over. I don't like snakes, so we'll just keep moving. But, but these people were dying from this. Let me tell you what the accusation will be, though. Well, I mean, if your God is so big and so strong and he's present, how come you have hard times? Well, there's probably more than one answer to that in life, but I can tell you what's going on here is that they're not with God. God is present, he's always present, but they're not with him. They're going their own way, they're grumbling against him, they're wanting to rebel against his leadership, and they're not with him. And so God allows, brings these serpents against them to try to get their attention and to, uh, to bring them back. And there are always consequences, I think, for our choices. But God also gives them, please hear me, they either all die or God redeems them. And what he's trying to do is show them, amongst other things, that if you would stop just walking away from me, stop trying to go your own way, I can handle all of these things. And if you'll trust me and look up at the serpent that I had made for you, I'm going to use that act of obedience uh, to heal you so that you will understand and humble yourself and draw nigh to me. Because of what? Because the question is not, is God with you? The question is, are you with God? And so everyone that looked up there lived, and uh, those who didn't uh, obviously died. And then it says that they began to take their journey, verse 10, where we began to read. And so they're somewhere down near the point or end of the Dead Sea, or of Edom there at the northern point of the Red Sea, somewhere in that area with Oboth. No one knows exactly where it's at. And they begin to go north. And we just sort of have the record of their going north. But there was this point, and don't forget it, that the reason that they got out and away from the serpents and the reason they survived that and they were beginning to move on is because they'd now gotten in one of those moments when they got their life back to understanding that God was what mattered and depending upon God. And they knew that they had no life without him because they would have all died in the wilderness had he not healed them through the mechanism of the raised up snake the brass and so they go along and we have this record they've been told by God not to touch Moab not to touch Ammon not to touch Edom and they camp out out in the wilderness to the east of all those places and this is all very simple 
But we come here and we read at verse 10 that they pitched to know both. Then they journey from there to Eja, Ej, uh, Avarim in the wilderness, which is before Moab toward the uh, sun rising, right? So it's between the border and the east, to the east of the border. And they removed from thence and passed, um, pitched in the valley of Zared. Now on the southern border, of course, the Zared River goes down through there and there's a valley and a canyon. And you can see all of that if you want to take the time to, to look it up. And then in verse 13, it says, from thence they m- removed and pitched on the other side side of Arnon so you have the Arnon River here and uh, just north of it I have the river marked in sort of bluish green I guess Uh, but uh, but you see that the line goes up and there's a circle there and that's them going through this valley of Arnon and and setting there and stopping from all that we read here right on the north side of the border of Moab but then the Bible says what we read earlier, that they were there in the, in the coast of the Amorites. The Amorites hate them. The Amorites are ultimately Canaanites. That's all that they are. They're the people who God will ultimately uh, push out from, uh, from and with Israel. And, uh, and so they pitch there. The Amorites are there. Moab is there. And they're between Moab and the Amorites. So that's just a little bit of the story. They're standing there, having crossed the, the brook of Arnon, the valley of Arnon, really quite a, uh, uh, really quite a canyon as it gets closer to the, uh, to the uh, Dead Sea there. But, but uh, they've, have, they've crossed that. But I want you to notice where they're standing. Because if you notice, they've got Moab, who doesn't want anything to do with them and wouldn't mind killing them, to their immediate south. They're on the land inhabited by the Amorites. It's their land. In fact, the land on the north side of the river Arnon, the Amorites ultimately took from Moab. It used to be Moab. Sometimes it's still called the plains of Moab, even though it belongs to the Amorites. And so they're standing there with the Amorites, and the Amorites really maybe didn't like anybody. The Canaanites were a pretty ruthless people. And so they're in peril there. And then, of course, you have the Ammonites, right? More of the offspring, right, of, of, uh, of Job, the second daughter of Job there. And they, both Israel's been told to leave them alone. And Ammon says, leave us alone. We won't help you. We don't want anything to do with you. We're happy if you die. And here's the nation of Israel coming out of this, following uh, the Lord, the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud, And they've come to this place where they're just walking with God. And it says that they're standing there. But then it makes this statement. And it says uh, in verse 14, Wherefore it is said in the book of the wars of the Lord, what uh, he did in the Red Sea and the brooks of Arnon, and at the stream of the brooks that goeth down uh, to the dwelling of Ar, and lieth upon the border of Moab. And that's the end of the statement. So listen to this statement, church. God takes this thing that was written in the book of the wars of the Lord and he puts it in here and it says this. Here's what what the observers say about this. What he did at the Red Sea, he also did at the brook of Arnon. Anybody struggle with that one? Let me help you. I've heard of the Red Sea all of my life. I've known the great miracle of the crossing of the Red Sea, I mean, literally all of my life. I, I've, I've probably done it in popsicle sticks. I, I mean that seriously. I don't remember it, but I probably have. Certainly with Tim Pura paint. I, I did the, you know. I mean, I've known the story. I've rehearsed the story. I've heard the story. You have too if you've been around the Word of God and the, and the Church of God for any period of time. And, and, and you know what? God constantly recites when he talks to the nation of Israel and they're getting out of the way, he says to them, hey, don't forget what I did at the Red Sea. You know, don't forget who I am that was demonstrated by what I did at the Red Sea. And historians, every nation of the ancient Near East that existed at that time has in their historical records uh, some evidence of the event of the Red Sea. It was a big deal. In fact, years later, I mean, even after this point, when they got up, they'll soon be there. And they went with the spies into Jericho. What did the, what did the uh, uh, lady there in the house say? She said, we heard what happened at the Red Sea. And we heard what happened as you went along the way. And we feared you and your God. I mean, that event was stupendous. And we would all acknowledge that, that it uh, demonstrated the power of God and that it, uh, that it, uh, that it showed uh, them that who God was and what God could do. And in fact, it identifies God, Exodus 15, right after it, as they sing the song of praise. God there is called a man of war. And would you understand that we serve a warrior God? But what happened at the brook of Ar? 
that was anything like that, the Brook of Arnon. I don't know about you, but I puzzled that for a period of time. Because I'm thinking, that must have been one big river. But I want you to know that the likeness or the equivalency, because God does draw an equivalency here, here doesn't he? He says what he did here and here. And he likens them exactly the same. But the equivalency is not a, not a geographical peril. It's completely different than that. But here's what is the same. At the Red Sea, as they stood there, sea to their front, imp impassable terrain to their north and south, and the Egyptian army coming through, through really trails in the rocks that are there, they faced certain death. And God stepped in and fought the battle for them. They were with God, and God fought the battle for them. And so he took them across that sea on dry land, destroyed the Egyptian army there in front of them, that they might all know that he is God. And he demonstrated himself to be a man of war, it says. And at the brooks of Arnon, as they cross over, would you understand that they are completely surrounded by nations who outnumber them and desire them to be dead? And they're sitting there in the midst of that, really not knowing where to go. You can't go to Moab. You can't go to Ammon. The Amorites want to kill you. There literally was no place for them to go forward from there. And then God stepped in. And the rest of this chapter talks about the battles that God won. They go from there to a place called Beer. We read about that. Beer is a Hebrew word for, for well. And he describes the well as one that the elders of the, of the crowd dug and that, uh, that they, uh, the people sang, you know, spring up a well. And, they, and, they, and, and God defeated the Amorites there. And they just go on up through there. If we, if we read all of this, he, he, de he defeats them city after city, we find out. They came to Balaam in verse uh, number uh, 16, and, and I'm sorry, that's chapter 22, uh, to uh, Matanah, as they get up there, uh, they, uh, Sihon, verse 21, the king of the Amorites, saying, let me pass through thy land. We wouldn't do that. Uh, so they end up fighting all of these Amorites. And, and there's uh, Sihon, the king of the Amorites, who uh, fought against the former king of Moab and took his land. And, and Israel goes against him. And you know what God does? God does what only God can do, is that as the warrior God, he defeats the Amorites. And they go further up, and they, uh, and they continue to defeat. And you can see that I have this journey from, from the north side of the Arnon River. They go all the way up into the area called Aram. Anybody know what, what area that is, what the other name of Aram is? It's Syria. They're just outside of Damascus really here. And if you notice, it should show up anyway, that there's red ink now uh, putting lines through that whole area from the Arnon River all the way up to the really the border or near Damascus there. And what happens there is that God really fighting the battle for them hands all of those. Uh, the Og, the king of Bashan. By the way, if you're ever a king, Og is a great name to have. I just want to go on record and say that. My name is Og, the king of Bashan. I like that name. They destroy every one of them. And God gives all that land on the east side of the Jordan to the nation of Israel. So, why? Number one, because they were walking in dependent obedience with him. And number two, what did this land become? Someone tell me. All the land with the red lines through it. What did that land become? Yeah, it became the two and a half tribes on the east side of the Jordan, right? Uh, Reuben, um, Gad, and the half tribe of Manasseh. All that land became a part, and it was a part of the Abrahamic covenant or land grant that God had given to Israel. And now he restored it through this time. And so what I'm telling you, and I want to make a little application, and we'll be done in over, over our time a little bit, and I think the application will draw this together. I didn't bring you here to, to tell you a story. 
I'm just telling you that you have to be able to see the difference of what happens in the nation of Israel when they in humility and surrender go with God instead of presuming that because there's a pillar there that God is with them. And church, I want you to learn this tonight for your life forever, that the question is not am I with God? The question is, is God with you? And we know this, we studied it not long ago, that if you seek me, God says, I will be found of you. But if you walk away from me, God doesn't change. God doesn't get mad. God doesn't throw, a, doesn't throw a temper tantrum and say, I never want to see you again. He lets you go your own way. And in your life, when you begin to walk your own way, you're making decisions without the guidance and wisdom of God, sometimes without the safety and provision of God. And I know that we all think we can muscle through those things somehow. I'm just here to tell you that there is no path to victory by faith that overcomes the world and that gives you that victory in your life. There's no path when you're not walking in surrender and obedience to God. That's being with God. And if you don't go with God, wherever you go, frankly, it doesn't matter how beautiful it is. You're not going to find victory. You'll find spiritual defeat time after time after time. And the book of Numbers recounts it. It recounts how the people went up uh, back in Numbers 14 that I already referenced. And they went up when God said, don't go up. And Moses said, you're going to go without God because he's not going to go with you because you've walked away from him. And they got waxed in that battle. And then we find how up at uh, the beginning of chapter 21 where they, they begin to repent and turn back to God. And God allows him to defeat the Canaanites. And then they walk in the wilderness and they begin to murmur against God again. They're going against God. And there's more to the whole journey. But we have these great events here where where God then sends these fiery serpents and says, look, if you're without me, nothing that matters will happen. Nothing of victory will happen in your life. You can't get to the promised land, which, by the way, is not heaven in our lives. It is the abundant, victorious life in Christ. You can't get there going on your own. And so they came back to God and he began to lead them along the way. And every time that they would just line themselves up in dependent obedience to God, they would have victory after victory after victory. In fact, this kind of string goes on all the way through Jericho. They come back down. They camp out for a while. God sends them right across the river to Jericho. They go to Jericho and they win another astounding battle, don't they? I mean, really... The Air Force could have won it. It didn't even require an army. I mean, they just marched around and God did the work. But you know what happened next? A town I call little old AI. So going with God, they had all of these victories. And then they look at AI and say, we don't need God for that. We don't even need all of our men. We're just going to take a few hand-picked men. We're going to go up to AI. We're going to punch them in the face. They're going to cry like babies. We're going to own that town too. And they went up there and they left with dead soldiers and no victories. And they came back down only to find Moses and the elders on their face saying, God, why did you do this to us? And God said, I didn't do anything to you. You went without me. And you mark it down. You study through the Word of God, every time that they say, we don't need you, God, they don't say those words, they say it with their life. And they go their own way, and they don't just walk in obedience to God and dependence upon Him. They get defeated. The book of Judges is a constant cycle of this. They get away from God, they seek other gods, they're defeated by a nation, they get right with God, because when you're not with God, or when God is not with you, that's when you're in trouble. So how do you, Keep yourself with God. If the, if the key to victory in your life is you being with God, how do you know you're with God? I think the way that we maintain that is by maintaining the relationship. Let me give you two quick applications from this whole body of things in the book of Numbers. Here's number one. If you want to constantly be walking with God so that you're with God, Here's number one. Be obedient at the first opportunity. And then I get this down. Delayed obedience is really disobedience. And that's what they found out in Numbers 14 at Kadesh Barnea. When God said to them through Moses, hey, don't go up because I'm not going with you and uh, you're going to wander in the desert, they went, no, 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 no. We decided we changed our mind. We were wrong a minute ago, so we're going to go ahead and go now, God. And what happened? They went up and got defeated. Why? Well, because they really weren't in obedience to God. 
They were maybe trying to manipulate God at that point into doing things. But if you want to walk with God, be obedient at the first opportunity. When God says something to you in your life from the word of God, when it's through preaching or when it's through your quiet time, when God speaks and God speaks through his word, don't say like, well, I don't know that. I think if you read that backwards, it means something totally different. No, no, don't do that. Be obedient at the first opportunity. I always marvel at guys who go like, I believe God is uh, you know, uh, calling me to do this or whatever or wants this in my life, and it's there in the word of God. I know that the Bible says it, but I just need to pray about it. I laugh at that, and not at them, but I laugh at the concept that God has spoken, I've heard him, and I'm praying about, what? Let's see how that prayer goes exactly. Oh, uh, God, it's me. I'm considering obeying what you told me to do in Ephesians chapter four, but I just don't know if I should. Could you give me some wisdom here? You think I'm kidding, but sometimes we're that ridiculous because we're often reluctant to obey at the first opportunity, aren't we? If you want to go with God, you and I need to obey what he says at the first opportunity. Let me tell you the second thing. That obedience always, obedience to God is always in accordance with the word of God. Right? Precisely. Now, don't leave off the word precisely. Let me show you. On this journey, the people are murmuring. God tells Moses to take his staff and Aaron and go out to a rock and speak to the rock so that water might come out. You remember that story? It's in like, mm, I don't know, chapter 16 or somewhere along that in the book of Numbers. And Moses goes out there and he's angry. By the way, the wrath of man still does not work the righteousness of God. And he goes out there and he's angry and he says something like this. It's a great preaching day. You'll know when the preacher's upset. He'll come in and go like, you bunch of heathen are driving me crazy. I'm paraphrasing slightly. In fact, I'm so mad at you. Kaboom, kaboom, kaboom. Water does come out of the rock. Moses never sees the promised land because of it. Because partial obedience. God told him three things. Gather the people, take your rod and speak to the rock. He faithfully gathered the people. He faithfully took his rod. But he didn't speak to the rock. Didn't do it. And God said, well, because you've disobeyed me this day, you're not going to go in the promised land. It's a pretty big loss for a short temper tantrum, wasn't it? Because when you get angry and you begin to do things your own or whatever you get, you walk away and God's not with you and victory comes by you being with God it also requires this in our life and I think it's just the it's the the normal outcome of the first two points but it's this that it requires that our lives be in complete dependence upon God so get this if our lives are not truly in dependence upon God then we will never obey him at first opportunity we will never obey him precisely i was talking to actually a couple of different people this week trying to help in their life and i talked to them about following jesus as a disciple and i talked to them about the parallel path and the discipleship is not on the parallel path that's not following the following is when we get behind him and we follow him as he says well if you want to walk a parallel path you need to know this that you're depending upon your own self and not god and you're ultimately, though you may be headed in the same general direction, you are not following the Lord. And victory is not really on that path. There'll be good days and bad. But that's called time and chance that happens to all men. Not victory in Jesus. I'd rather have victory in Jesus than time and chance. How about you, church? And the way we get there is by going with God. And the way we ultimately go with God is by obeying him at first opportunity. Did your mother ever say this to you when you were growing up? Young man, young lady, don't make me repeat myself. She was trying to teach you to obey at first opportunity, wasn't she? 
And whoever your mother was or however she lived, I'm going to tell you what, that principle is God's principle. So church, listen to this. We have a big work to do. We have a lot of stuff going on. I'm thankful for it. We have more that we need to have going on. We have burdens that are too big for us to fix. We have people's lives we encounter. I mean, you know all of these things. Here's the way that it gets done. When we go with God. Not in the same general direction, but in obedient dependence upon God. And then God can do in, in and through our lives what only God can do. Do you understand? Sometimes this seems so small. But if you think it's little, go to Kadesh Barnea. Where they ultimately went where God had originally told them to go, but they went without God. And if you were standing back from the bird's eye view, you might go like, well, I mean, they mostly obeyed. And mostly obeying is neither obedience or dependence upon God. So church, let's go with God. God not him with us us with him amen father thank you for our time I pray you bless your word in our life and Lord I pray you'd help me I know that I like probably everyone in this room has got places in my life where I have to die to myself every day to follow you I'm thankful that they're different today than they were five years ago and I'm thankful God that you're faithful and you're patient, but God, I don't want, I don't want simply time and chance to direct my life. I want to go with you, the great warrior God, so that you can direct my path and you can fight your battles in my life and that you can bring victory into my life as I walk with you, not close to with you, not in the same direction, but in dependent obedience with you. Give me grace, God, because you know better than anybody here, I need it, and I ask you for it. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You have your prayers.